Hi everyone, welcome to Connecting the Dots. Connecting the Dots is an outreach educational program brought to you by Aphasia SG. So this is part of our Aphasia Awareness Month outreach um, and today is our final episode. So what is Connecting the Dots? Well, every week we bring in an expert speaker uh, from different healthcare disciplines to share their expertise and knowledge. Uh, basically what we want We are a non-profit organization that supports persons with aphasia and their caregivers. We run free community programs. We run, we run free community programs such as Chit Chat Cafe, um, Aphasia Choir, and Games Craft Night. And we also do lots of um, free outreach like this, basically to raise awareness of aphasia. Tonight is our final episode. And we are so honored and proud to actually bring to you an expert speaker, Dr. Chan Yao. Dr. Chan Yao is a senior consultant anesthesiologist and an intensive care physician. He's also the director of <clears throat> sorry. He's also the director of home ventilation and respiratory support service from Tan Tok Seng Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Chan. Hi, Evelyn. Thanks Hi. for being here. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us. Um, yes, let's, you know, start off by asking you, actually, what do you do? Uh, it, you know, what's this discipline, anesthesiology and intensive care medicine? And how, you know, how did you get into it? Okay, um, well, anesthesiology, basically, in the public's eye, they think that we put people to sleep. And, uh, and then after that, we can buy stocks and share, surf the web and so on. To some extent, true, but actually, if we just have to put you to sleep, a hammer will do the trick, right? <laughs> but I think um, I, I did anesthesiology as the first, my first post housemanship posting. And initially, I was rather disappointed to be posted there. But I got to love the experience and um, I also found that I have an aptitude for it. So essentially what we do is that we give the patients who come to us deadly poisons. So we make them, rob them of their consciousness and we rob them of their ability to move any muscle in the body so that the surgeon can traumatize them by opening up their cavities and reaching into the inside and repairing the damaged organs. So that's what we do. And after that, we have to then restore their consciousness, restore their movement, make sure that they have survived the whole ordeal and hopefully wake up without a stroke, a heart attack or any disability. So that's the beauty of our job. So in all the Latin countries like Italy, Spain and France, we are not endless that is, we are anesthesiology and reanimation. We reanimate people. Huh? <laughs> we put the soul back into you. Okay, so that, was, that was the beauty of my discipline, you know, when I, I first encountered it. And it's really such an experience of hmm. taking a sick patient through a very major surgery. And when he or she comes out well, we are all very happy. Yeah. But of course, with anesthesiology, the encounter is uh, very episodic. So I may see a patient for at most two or three days, one day before op, on the op day, and maybe one day post-op. And so there's that absence of the continuity of interaction. So I got itchy and I decided to go into intensive care. And um, where, again, we, we capitalize on familiarity with all these drugs. Uh, that uh, deal with all the vital body functions, as well as the use of different equipment, high-tech equipment, breathing machines, all sorts of tubes and lines, monitors, to take patients through the most uh, severe episodes of uh, critical illness. So critical illness could be due to medical reasons, like for example, COVID, heart attack, strokes. It could be due to trauma, like if you are involved in a road accident, or maybe you need to undergo cancer surgery. So yeah. there's a wide spectrum, but the commonality is that the patient for a certain period of time has got major multiple derangements in all the vital organ functions. So in intensive care, we take the patient through. Mm. And well, then serendipitously while doing intensive care, uh, I encountered uh, patients. The first patient was a spinal cord injured patient who ended up being dependent on the breathing machine. And then started our wonderful adventure 13 years ago where 
a whole bunch of, of very passionate people came together and then we started the home ventilation program, mm. which I'm grateful to the Singapore government. We finally achieved our permanent funding this year. Mm. Yes, but we are not the first because KK Children's has been doing this for 20 years. They've got a very good complex home care program for mm. critically ill patients. So, so I think our government is wonderful because they do put the money where the important value is and they they do look after our people and we are grateful to them yeah actually it sounds like you work with all sorts of patients right who yes. I mean, <laughs> yes. actually work with all um but i suppose because you are from tantok saying mostly adult patients uh. yes we, we we look after uh, only adult patients in tantok mm-hmm. mm-hmm. yeah and actually, the, um, you know, at this point, I just want to shout out to our Facebook audience. If you have any questions to ask, uh, ask Dr. Chan, please feel free to type your questions in the chat, okay? We are here to answer all your burning questions. Um, and if you have comments as well, we will love to hear from you. Yeah. Can I qualify uh, that I can't dispense uh, personalized medical advice here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, obviously, you should see your own doctor, but yes, I'll try yes. to help provide general uh, Top um, understanding as far as I can. Uh, thanks for that. thanks for adding that. Uh. yeah. So so yeah. This is not speed dog. Uh. Please don't please don't ask <laughs> please don't ask personal medical questions on Facebook Live. Okay, not the right platform. <laughs> yeah. So um, actually, you know, you you explain you know fairly quite a, a bit of what you you do. How often do you work with patients who have communication problems or impairment? Then. Okay. Um, in terms of the ICU. I think when, and I do about 10 weeks of intensive care a year, um, all the ICU patients are challenged in terms of communication, primarily because of us, we are the problem. Because while trying to resuscitate them and, and support their organ functions, we often have to intubate them. That means you put a breathing tube from the mouth into the windpipe, and uh, that robs you of your ability to talk vocally. So. Wow. A lot of the ICU patients, and even after we remove the breathing tube for various reasons, either the vocal cords are swollen, mm-hmm. or maybe the patient might be a little bit delirious or confused yeah. due to the critical illness or due to the sedative medications, they still continue to have communication difficulty. Uh-huh. So this is a big part of my work where I think we, we have gone beyond just resuscitating people looking at normal saturation and blood pressure numbers, we are interested in <clears throat> restoring the personality back to the person, waking them up from their confusion, mm. giving them a voice if they don't mm. have a voice. My other part of the work is, uh, as you alluded to, home ventilation. And here again, well, almost 100% of my patients have some kind of communication challenges. So it could be from the treatment, so from our ventilation and with the ventilator and tracheostomy. It could be because they have got neuromuscular issues affecting the vocal cord function or because their breathing is just not in, strong enough to generate the voice. Yeah. And I have a small number of stroke patients who have uh, also passed through the home ventilation program. And later, mm-hmm. I'm privileged to share the story of a, an engineer who, who has very kindly allowed us to share his story. Yeah, we're very excited to, to hear some case studies from you. Um, for Do you have any images to share about ven- home ventilation? I mean, I think some of our members of the audience may not be so familiar with it. So pictures always tells a thousand words uh, if you have. Yeah. Um, okay, let me, yeah. let me get to the share screen. And, um, and okay, would, would you want me to go through these now or... Uh, sure. Actually, I love this title. Ah, uh. wow. <laughs> can can okay. my loved one come Maybe again? I dwell on this for a little while because yeah. I think for the public, you may or may not be familiar with uh, education of doctors. But uh, in the Singapore system, we we generally go through a five year medical uh, program. So the first two years are basic science. So we learn biochemistry, physiology, anatomy. So that's like. Biochemistry is all about the chemicals. Uh, physiology is how the body functions. And anatomy is uh, why the body parts are all named in Greek and Latin. Uh. Okay, so, so like this muscle is called biceps, <laughs> right? And, and so on and so forth. Um, then we spend three years where we are posted to all the clinical disciplines. 
and uh, we learn a little bit, very little bit about everything. And at the end of the five years, we go through, we have gone through many tests and exams, but the final exam is uh, basically like a massive test of your memory plus test of your, your ability to think on your foot. And then suddenly you get a title doctor. But what I realized that was that this journey, it gives us a lot of head knowledge, but it doesn't give us a lot of uh, experience and uh, certainly our knowledge is uh, broad but uh, not in depth and uh, in in my case I, I went to medical school in 89 to 94 I certainly didn't know learn at all how to communicate with disadvantaged patients mm. if anything the the whatever I learned was from mentorship so I was an apprentice and I watched some masterful physicians but they didn't try to, to teach us communication as a module. And I hope that eventually in a few months or years in Singapore, we can have this. But um, we may see like a neurologist communicate with a patient who's, who's had a stroke or who's got Parkinsonism. But whatever lessons we glean is just from observation. And it's not even the most important part of the lesson because the the teacher will be trying to teach us about why this part of the brain is affected and therefore the patient moves like that and looks like that and talks like that. But it didn't occur to anybody that, hey, we need to learn how to communicate with them. Mm. Right? Mm. And so, so this is something that I'm, I'm still learning over the years. And I learned from speech therapists. So speech therapists, as you know, are healthcare professionals who who, uh, well, even you're a speech therapist, so why am I doing this? <laughs> I don't know. I was uh, there are professionals who specialize in, <laughs> you know, um, two things. One is uh, how you swallow, and, and therefore, can you swallow and eat and drink safely? But secondly, how you articulate. So it could be by talking, verbal communication, or non-verbal communication. And therefore, I found myself learning so much from speech therapists throughout my career. And, the child, uh, I chop, uh, we do more than just do things. Uh. <laughs> okay, okay. We sorry. also work on things like voice disorders and we do things like stuttering, you know, and, and yeah, but but yes, yes. I think these two main areas that you just highlighted, right, are the areas that you work most closely with, you know, the speech therapists in your hospital, right? Yes. Um, and and you know, I think it's it's great la, that you work so closely with, with speeches, you know, it's, it's amazing. We wish to have this kind of relationship with. We always say that we, you know, we, we help to keep the patient alive. We preserve their body, but you, you guys preserve the, the soul of the patients because Aww, you, a... you allow the trap personality to come out. Feeling right. so that quote, feeling that quote, uh, that quote we, we preserve the soul of the patient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because because ultimately we are all persons means we can we can like or dislike things, we can choose, and we have got a, abstract thoughts that we can express. Yeah. Mm. So mm. I think that is uh, something which uh, only speech therapists in the, within the whole healthcare spectrum you all value this the most. I think you're right to say that we value this the most. Um, you know, especially for me, I always, you know, think about if I were to lose that, you know, that ability to communicate what's going to happen to me. I, I, I think that's, that must be my biggest living fear. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, yeah. So, you know, thank, I think thank you for, for sharing that. So I gather that you work very closely with the speech therapist, you know, which is, which is great. Um, so, you know, do you want to share with us a little bit more about how doctors can help, you know, since that's the title of your slides, right? <laughs> well done. Uh, are you seeing the thing okay? Yes, I, I'm seeing the slide. I'm seeing the slide. Yeah. Okay. You know, so, okay. yeah. Yeah, I just breezed through my slides. Huh? So, okay, oh, you, yeah. you don't pay me to come to this. This is my generic lecture slide. So, um, Tan Tok Seng Hospital, beautiful Singapore, and our wonderful founder who set such a great example donating his money. This is my hero, Dr. Bjorn Ibsen. He's a Danish intensive care specialist, or rather he's the first intensive care physician in the world. He was an anesthetist and he participated during the polio epidemic. So polio, like any, a lot of viral illnesses, causes a lot of problems with the, the nerves, the brain, the spinal cord, and the patients are very weak. They don't have the strength to move. They don't have the strength to cough. Their lungs and breathing passages get clogged 
clogged up with secretions. So Dr. Bjorn Ibsen was in America training and he brought back the technique of ventilating, that means breathing a patient through an artificial breathing tube. So he recruited medical students, so this was a medical student, to use a handbag to, to help a patient to breathe. So they had like 400 students taking shifts to look after batches of patients. So this was the first intensive care unit. And when I read the story, I was like, my, you, you know, I was really struck, amazed. Mm. Well, but um, the Danish experience did highlight that while a lot of the polio patients survived, they did have problems. They, a lot of them ended up staying in the hospital and institutions. Yeah. So similarly, there were polio patients in England and France, and there it was. It was actually, again, the story goes that doctors and nurses are good at preserving life, but actually it is concerned people who help you get back your life. So if you allow me to digress, Evelyn, in France, mm -hmm. Lyon, which is the food capital of France, there was an association that was from Association of Friends of Polio Patients. And they started by demanding that the hospitals allow them to bring their loved ones home for the weekend for a, for a short break. And of course, these patients were on breathing machines, you know. So by then, the engineers had device ventilators to be connected to the patient. Hmm. But these family members say, I want my husband to come home. Yeah. We have a birthday party. And then the doctor say, no, it's too dangerous. And so they brought it to the Ministry of Health and ding dong for a while before finally they were allowed to do so. So mm. these family members and friends kind of like arm-twisted doctors and nurses to, to train them to look after their loved ones. And this was the start of a beautiful journey. Yeah. A similar story in the UK. Mm. So remember in the 60s, 50s and 60s, the, the Russians had cosmonauts who were going up into space and America had astronauts who were going to the moon. And the UK polio patients called themselves Responauts because they were stuck to ventilators. They're looking like, you know, strange people with tubes and masks and, you know. But they also rebelled and refused to stay in hospital and they went home. And that was the start of the home ventilation program. Right. Ah, so that's the genesis. Uh, the genesis of like, all this home, uh, the home ventilation program came from those times, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that there are, you know, loved ones who, who fought and advocated for the patients. Otherwise, you know, can you imagine, the, you know, this population of patients will still be stuck in the hospital even yeah. now. Yeah. Actually, our Singapore story is exactly the same. It also started with a small group of patients whose relatives refused to accept the status quo and say that, look, I want to bring my husband home. Mm. And, mm. You know, that was how they motivated us to start with this. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I'll skip this slide. This is just a, a, a slide to teach people about what happens when we breathe. Looks very chim. <laughs> and, and these are actually the physiological endpoints quite that we try to control. These are these are the structures and these are the processes and how things can go wrong. So I'll skip this. Um, I, can I should I talk about this a little bit? So, yes. Yeah. So this is a this is a kind of a a bot that we see very commonly in the wards, right? In the right. in the inpatient wards. And tell us what you know. Why did you take a picture of this? Okay. So these bots are actually meant to allow uh doctors and nurses to communicate with the patients better. Hmm. Uh, okay, Evelyn, I confess just now I told you the wrong story. I I had it mixed up. But this was the bot of a patient who had a stroke. So hmm. he was. This arteric. He so with stroke, you may have uh, problems with with uh, understanding that it's like receptive aphasia, or you have problems you understand but you can't express expressive aphasia, can't find words, can't make the sounds, make the sentences, or the stroke may cause uh, problems with the tongue, the vocal cords, and uh, you cannot articulate. And so this patient was a patient who had a stroke. And severe dysarthria. So he was, in a sense, non verbal at that point. Mm. But he, I can't remember whether he's Tamil or whether he was a Hokkien or something. But this was the label that was on his headboard. Yeah. And I saw it, um, I was doing a tracheostomy round at the time. I saw this, I was furious. So I took a photo and I sent it to the nursing director. Mm. 
Mm. And subsequently, I use it in a lot of lecture sites because I said this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is true that this patient cannot currently communicate, but we know that he is like Chinese, Malay, Indian, you know, he, he can speak Hokkien, English, Tamil, whatever. So you should be writing that he used to speak Tamil, used to speak Malay. Then all of us who come to talk to him will try to talk to him or her in the language he or she is most familiar with. And even if he or she cannot talk, they may be able to give you a thumbs up, a thumbs down, can nod and shake head. And this is still communication. And at least this makes a person feel appreciated. They are human. Mm. And this also allows them to communicate their needs. The need may be that, you know, oh, the, oh, I've got this, this problem here. I can't reach my back while it's itching. Or it may be that tomorrow is my wife's birthday and I really want to, to send her a love message. Yeah. Right. So, so, but if we rob our patients of that, then, then the patients will, get, will lose heart. So what happens to a lot of patients in the hospital are very depressed. And then we, we take it that depression is a common part of the stroke recovery journey. Depression is part of cancer, depression is this. And then we just give them uh, medications and we, we think, okay, la, the medications are not working. There's nothing more I can do. But sometimes getting to the non-pharmacological aspects may be even more important than just giving them a pill. Mm, agree, agree. I, I, you know, I, I wish we uh, had more, more healthcare professionals and doctors who share the same school of, uh, of thought as you. Um, you know, because at Aphasia SG, the thing that we always stress is communication is more than just verbal, right? It's more than just the spoken language. Um, even if, you know, your loved one or somebody you know is not speaking, uh, it doesn't mean that they are not communicative. And so I think this is a... a, a, a real challenge. Lah. Um, and, and I think uh, also earlier on when you mentioned dysarthria, so uh, I think commonly in healthcare, if the loved one or somebody sees a discharge or, or, or you know, a note that says slurred speech, ah, so that's like layman's term, right? This mm. dysarthria is like a motor weakness, you know, so it's like slurred speech. So a stroke patient actually can have aphasia, can have dysarthria, or they can even have apraxia of speech, uh, which is a, a coordination problem. They can actually have all these problems, you know, uh, which renders it really challenging uh, for them to communicate. And then, of course, you add on this layer of language difference, right? So in the words I've seen, Bangladeshi workers, obviously, we don't speak the same language, right? But still, you know, we need to, we need to acknowledge that we speak different languages and let's try to make it work, the whole communication exchange. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think uh, what you've highlighted is so important. Um, so actually, this ties into the next question that uh, we have, uh, uh, which is we often hear anecdotes, right, from our from the members of our community uh, who has aphasia, right, about their horrible encounters in the hospital. So for example, uh, we heard this anecdote from one of our participants who said he was super, super angry because the doctor, obviously the neurologist, knew of his diagnosis, right? Um, and he has mostly receptive, uh, uh, he has mostly expressive aphasia, but no receptive problems. But the doctor insisted on only talking to his wife, talking over him, talking to his oh. wife. So that's one encounter. And then there's another patient who was super upset um, and she has receptive aphasia. And she said, every time I go to the hospital to see the doctor, it is a traumatic experience. Uh, in, to quote her, it's a traumatic experience. No matter how many times I tell them to write down, don't just say to write down because she has receptive aphasia. They won't do so. So my question is, why are some doctors not more um, understanding about communication impairment? <laughs> well, I, I think I, I really cannot... Uh, I can only apologize on behalf of my whole profession. Please don't, nah, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm guilty of it many times also. So, so while well, there, there are moments when I'm... Uh, struck by the need for more humanity. Many times I'm rushing and I may brush over these. So I, th I think it comes with like professional culture. So traditionally doctors are in position of power because we are deemed to be knowledgeable. We are deemed to have the magic treatment in our hand or be the pill or the injection or the machine. So doctors are high and mighty. And you know, the, in the old school, the doctor says you, you take this and you'll get well. Mm. Uh, and uh, so we, we do not know how to 
listen and we do not like to acknowledge our inadequacies. So I think um, I, what I propose, Evelyn, is after this, let's write down some of these learning points and then uh, we need to put it in writing on aphasia.sg and then I'll share it with my doctor friends on Facebook as well. Sure, yeah. And I think we, we need to share this on social media in a way that doesn't hurt uh, their professional pride, but in a very kind and gentle way to remind doctors, nurses and other therapists about the importance of communication. And then we also need to constantly see how to sneak this into the ongoing education of professionals. I agree. As yeah. well as uh, get to the root, which is the medical school and the nursing school. So let's see, after today, let's see how we can formalize this and put this into some kind of uh, to-do list for... Yes, yes, uh, I agree. Education. Like an action plan of sorts, right? Yes. But, um, then, then what advice do you have for caregivers, you know, caregivers of uh, a patient who has a communication impairment, you know, in, in their navigation of the healthcare system, uh, what advice do you have to them? I know some, yeah, so maybe maybe just your thoughts. Uh. Mm. I think, unfortunately, sometimes uh, I'm talking to the patients and family members. Now, you have to demand and stand up for your rights. So you have to say, doctor, listen to me. And then you da, 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 da. And then maybe you apologize and say, I'm sorry for being so, <laughs> so, so insistent, but, you know. So a combination of assertiveness and um, assertiveness. So say, uh, talk to me or talk to my loved one and so on. And then he wants to do this or she wants to do this. Okay, so be assertive, but be nice and gentle. But don't, don't complain to MP and don't write to Prime Minister. Like it makes us even more defensive because what happens when you said Prime Minister was sent to MOH, MOH sent to hospital CEO, and then it comes down and we got answer a long email and it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So, but you directly demand and say, please, um, we we'll appreciate if you explain this to us. Um, I think it's important that my loved one learn how to communicate, uh, you know, and maybe he can write, maybe he can do this. Mm. Okay, of course, if that doctor re refuses to look at writing and so on, then maybe you might have to change the doctor or write to his HOD or something. Yeah. If he's already a specialist, then you book and you have to change doctor. Like, but if it's a junior doctor, you can you yeah. can ask to speak to his senior. Mm. Uh, so this is coming from Dr. Chan Yao, not us, uh, because this is <laughs> no, but it is true that we have to listen to patients. Mm. And um, often, while you may not have the full uh, technical knowledge, you have a better understanding of yourself or your loved one. Mm. And um, mm. that is a very important part of the care. So we are collaborating. So it's it's like we are we are doing the we are sharing the care and ultimately you live your life or your loved one's life mm. and therefore you have a right and a duty to speak up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what we always tell our caregivers, right? To advocate for their loved ones who actually are not able to advocate for themselves. So obviously as a family member, um, they, they have to be in that role, uh, that um, asking question role. Yeah, yeah. but... I think yeah, it's it's good. I'm I'm glad you you are sharing your perspective on this. You know because you are you, you know you could be at the receiving end uh, of answering questions. Yes, and if I'm <laughs> wrong, I apologize now, and I will apologize again. No uh, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah, I um. So another question, right? That's come up is um, how you know how challenging is it for you, right? Working with uh patients who have aphasia versus those who don't have aphasia. You know. Okay. Uh, and if you have any personal stories to share, please, you know, please feel free to, yeah. Okay, I must confess I don't have a lot of encounters with aphasia because while I work in the neuro neurosurgical ICU, mm. um, so I do have some patients with aphasia, but I look after them in the very early part of the illness ah. where generally speaking, verbally, it's not a very important part of the, of the journey. So like the... The, let's say someone has a hemorrhagic stroke in the left cerebral hemisphere, the left side of the brain, they often will be very happy if they can open eyes to calling as opposed to opening eyes to pain or not opening the eyes. Mm. They're very happy if they can, they can localize pain. So let's say if I rub their chest bone here, the sternum, they can reach for it. Mm. And we think that, oh, he's doing very well already. 
you know so so that's like the kind of progress we are seeing in icu so i don't really have a lot of experience with aphasia mm. but uh, and and because i'm not a stroke physician therefore the stories i tell will largely not be about stroke patients but mm. I remember there was a young boy who had a traumatic brain injury and initially he was what they call vegetative state nowadays we say unresponsive wakefulness state now we we i think we need to move away human beings are not vegetables and we need to change our terminology and be more respectful. So he was initially in unresponsive wakefulness state, moved to minimally conscious state. So again, this guy, young boy, he's very lucky. His parents loved him. So if you are loved, you will do well. So if your loved one is sick, please love them very much. They will do better. Okay. Mm-hmm. So he was loved by his family. Then he was readmitted for an infection. Now I can't remember whether it's a lung infection or urine infection. I think it might have been a urine infection mm. because he wasn't, he wasn't on a breathing machine. And I remember that while we treated his uh, low blood pressure, we call it septic shock from urine infection, he, he, we also had a privilege to witness his recovery of his co- communication. Mm. So his name was, uh, I changed the name. Uh, so say, say his name is Johnny. So one day we'll say, hello, good morning. What is your name? Then he'll be Johnny. Uh, how are you today? Johnny. Mm-hmm. Do you know what day of the week it is? Johnny. So, so he was just saying Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. Uh, I don't know what's happening inside there, but um, he's, maybe he likes the sound of his name. But along the way, one morning I said, good morning. How are you? What's your name? Johnny. How are you? No good. Wow, that was music to my ears because suddenly the the sounds have a meaning. Yeah. You know, and you can see that really that soul waking up in that body. And, and it was a life-changing moment for me and for the team. I hope it was a life-changing moment for the team, for my junior doctors who, who were with me. But we were so thrilled to, yeah. to see that. And, and I think you guys are privileged to accompany patients in, in this kind of journey, right? Yeah, I, I love your anecdotes, right? I mean, it's it, it's amazing. Just hearing this story is, is, yeah, I know I know what you mean. I mean, I, you know, just sharing like, I, I started to think about my TBI patient and one who has been non-verbal for a year. Everybody's kind of given up that he will ever speak. And then one day, um, he said something. He just went like, ow or I. And, and I remember all of us went like, we wanted to like pop champagne, you know. <laughs> it's one of those things, yeah. Oh. On this point, can I have a bit of advice for the general public? So I think um, I think without putting ourselves on a guilt trip, so if, if you really have got no, no capacity, you know, and you and I know Singaporeans, we're all from small families, we're all looking after two parents and two in-laws, and so on and so forth. We are not rich and life is expensive. So so you may not be able to look after your loved ones at home but if you can please do it why because i think a lot of people say oh if i send my loved one to a nursing home they'll be after by professionals yes but the for if you bring your loved one home and you have let's say you manage to employ a maid to look after your loved one and you have yourself your spouse and the children there are like five or six people who are around this person who's recovering Mm. And there are more moments of encounter. Whereas if you go to a nursing home, usually the ratio is like one nurse with one nursing aide may look after like a total of 15, 12 to 15 or even more patients. Mm. So the the nursing home staff, they are very heroic. They really try their best to look after the patients well. But they really have their hands full feeding, dispensing medication, doing hygiene, just from A to Z. And they don't have time to spend with the loved one. And then, you know, during seasons like COVID when no visitation and all that, mm-hmm. the patients in the homes really suffer. So my plea to family members is be courageous, learn how to care for your loved ones, bring them home. Mm-hmm. That is often the best way for them to, yeah. to rehabilitate after a stroke or after a major mm-hmm. injury. But of course, if you, your family circumstances don't permit that, then please don't be guilty. Let them go to a nursing home, but please do visit them as often as you can and interact with them, with mm. your loved ones. Yeah. yeah. I don't know whether this is fair. Um, what do you think, Evelyn? I think, 
I thank you so much for sharing this candid view because that is something um, that's on my mind. I am covering, I'm covering some homes and I, every time I go in, I feel that way. Uh, but I guess I don't want to comment on, um, I guess people, I know everybody has different family circumstances, but I do feel that many, many um, patients who actually end up in the nursing home uh, uh, are not taken care of as well as they they are in a home, no matter how you think a uh, home is very jialat, right? But whatever it is, they still get more stimulation and more communication opportunities than in the nursing home because, uh, yeah, like what Dr. Chan said, the ratio, you know, the nursing aid to nurse ratio, right? Uh, resident, they don't call them patients, uh, in the nursing home, they call them residents to staff. It's, it's very low, the ratio, you know, and uh, when we talk about things that, uh, for example, somebody would enjoy like food, oftentimes in a nursing home, they don't, they don't get to enjoy the food that they get to enjoy at home, right? And they may not even get to speak the same home language. Like for example, if they speak um, Hokkien or Cantonese, who's going to speak that kind of language to them in the nursing home, right? I, yeah, so I, you know what you said really hit me, really, really hit me because I feel that way all the time every single time I go into the NH. Yeah. I, I think um, there are two angles here. One is the genuine stress of uh, juggling yeah. all your tasks. So uh, a lot yeah. of young, young adults have uh, hands to earning money, yeah. paying for uh -huh. all these things. The second is, uh, so that, that bit is objective and you may have no choice or maybe you are in poor health. Yeah. So you're in poor health and you can't look after your spouse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But there's also the fear factor. So some people say, I, what if I don't look after my father well? Or what if I don't look after my, my spouse well? Mm -hmm. So then they fear and they say, let the professionals do it. If you have that in mind, then trust me, I think all the public hospital doctors, nurses and therapists are very ready to, to teach you how to look after your loved ones. Yeah. And yeah. an analogy is parenting. So, you know, when we first have our kids, I didn't know how to clean my son's backside, you know, wow, how to do that. But no parent would think about, okay, I'll let the professionals do it, send my kid to an orphanage, right? So, <laughs> so you learn and you do it yourself. And after a while, well, I may do it wrongly. I may use the wrong temperature to bathe him. You know, I, I clean the backside the wrong way or that. After a while, but the positive things about being together outweigh the mistakes that you'll make. So don't worry. Uh, just be brave and learn and I think the doctors and nurses and therapists in the hospitals are more than happy to support yeah. you yes yeah definitely uh, at this juncture I'm going to just shout out to our Facebook audience thank you so much for all your comments coming in uh, we have a comment from uh, Yu Choi who says patient needs family indeed yeah uh, and and um, Ada Rush said, I don't have many encounters as well. I'm not sure what's the context of this, maybe an earlier topic, uh, but I'm from the operate, I'm from OT, I'm from operating theater whereby patient communication is very little, uh, but this is a very good and interesting topic. Thank you for having this on uh, live. Thank you for joining us. You know, we, we are really, really happy that you're tuning in. Uh, and Mindy, Mindy says, accord dignity and respect to the patient. Don't talk down to the person. Yeah, thank you so much. We, we welcome your questions. We welcome your comments. Uh, uh, we, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, Jeannie says, communication is very important in recovery. Family members uh, are not, family members not going to know what patient needs. Uh, patient needs to tell family what is bothering them. Everybody needs to work together. Yeah. So I, I think it's really this concept of, um, uh, uh, you know, collaboration. So yeah, and family needs to care for the, the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wow, wow, the comments are coming in fast and furious. Okay. Uh, okay, there's one comment from Serene who said, Hi, Dr. Chan and Evelyn. My husband had an ischemic hemorrhagic stroke from chronectomy four years ago and suffers from expressive aphasia. From a person whose first language was English in the past, he now speaks Mandarin and Cantonese, which he was clueless about prior. Relearning language and speech is thus difficult because spelling and pronunciation in English doesn't make much sense to him. Yeah, thanks for sharing this, Serene. Uh, first of all, we're very sorry to hear about your husband and I, I hope, you know, um, it's been four years and uh, that, you know, you've worked out some way of communicating with him. I'm not quite sure what your question is. Maybe it's just a comment. Uh, but we do, we do see patients like this uh, where... 
uh, they start to maybe maybe uh, the working language is English, right? But after a stroke and with aphasia, they start to actually uh, express more uh, mother tongue or a childhood language that they haven't spoken in years. You know, um, I actually see quite a few of this kind of patients. Huh? Um, Dr. Chai, what's your experience? Huh? I've got zero experience with this, so I'll defer to your experience. Okay. But, um, I am impressed, Serene, by you know the devotion of your family, so that you've allowed your husband to reach this stage. So the only thing I can say is don't give up. I think keep keep going on, and maybe this is an opportunity for the rest of family to also brush up on Mandarin and Cantonese. But but I I think if you are not in touch with a, a proper speech therapy coach, please. Uh, get in touch so that um, yeah, maybe the, the experts can help you there. Yeah. And maybe I... one day he might recover his facility in English. Um, I'll share an anecdote about a healthcare guru. So he's, I can't remember his name. I think he's Chris Claytonson or something. He's, he's an American guy, but he was a, a guru in uh, management and all that. But he himself had diabetes and he had a stroke and the stroke affected his uh, speech area. And he literally had to learn language all over again. But when he recovered from the stroke, it also gave him all the insights into healthcare. And then he became mm. a consultant to worldwide healthcare organizations, including National Healthcare Group, that talks saying, mm. you know, he came to give us some talks about it. So, so relearning how to speak is uh, challenging, it's very difficult, and not everybody makes it to the end of the journey. But I think there are enough anecdotes of people who do. So I think while we don't, we don't hold it against ourselves if we don't reach the end goal, I think all of us have a right to dream yeah. and reach mm. for it. I yeah. don't know, uh, Yifin, am I wrong in... So no, I think, um, you know, and, and somebody was just asking me about aphasia today, about um, recovery. So you know, when somebody suffers from aphasia, of course, it depends on, uh, the prognosis depends on the severity of the stroke, you know, and even things like uh, we talk about the baseline of the person, you know, and then the age. So all that actually comes into play. Uh, so we cannot, we cannot predict uh, for sure at, you know, at a certain, at a certain point uh, at the start, you know, when the person got a stroke, how well he's going to recover in six months, in a year. But we do know of uh, patients who do recover very, very well. We gain almost full function, but we also know that it can be a chronic condition. Some regain uh, a certain amount and then some less. Uh, so we want to stress that when it comes to communication, right, let's try to think out of the box a bit and not think of it as a verbal thing, which we talked about earlier. So it's not just about uh, the precision, you know, of your articulation, uh, or even how how extensive your vocabulary is, but uh, you know, the ability for this person to communicate using whatever means possible, um, his wishes, you know, his needs. I think uh, that's one way to look at it, um, and and then it might just alleviate some of the stress uh, that the patient and the family members feel. Please, yeah. Can I at this point then consult you about a friend? So I'm a close friend of a, of a person from an intellectual profession who mm. suffered a stroke. Yeah. And he made good initial progress mm. and his wife was his uh, companion and she really helped in coaching him. So I think that speech therapist was very impressed by the progress. Mm. But I think along the way, there's uh, coping with the performance Mm. Anxiety, coping with the not doing as well as I would like to. So, and then of course there are good days and bad days. So, what advice do you have for stroke patients in this situation? You know, we want to do better, but today mm. I, yeah, for some reason I can't find the words, or for some reason I'm just very irritable, and I, yeah, yeah. I thanks for asking that question, and I cannot, I, I obviously cannot speak in the first person, right? I, you know, um, but what I've learned from some patients is that they. You know, and some of them can be maybe personality can personality can be a bit type A, uh, meaning they are a bit more high strung or they are achievers, right? So they set themselves this target of I want to regain my full ability to speak in one month, in two months. So they set this kind of goal. And sometimes when they set this goal, right, uh, it stresses them up. What some of the patients who who were like that but learn to cope, that means uh, we're talking about 
uh, patients who have learned to cope maybe after a few years, right? They share with us that the turning point could be that they learn to embrace themselves, the new self. So they start to see that actually the stroke was a turning point in their life and they learn to embrace the 2.0. can sit here and talk till the cows come home, right? But to be in that position where your ability is taken from you overnight, I cannot imagine how that must feel devastating, to say the least, right? So um, it will take time, I think, for a person to come to terms with certain, with certain disabilities. Um, and we're not saying that if you come to terms with it, you're accepting it. But, you know, it's about maybe just letting nature run its course while doing due diligence. Does it make sense? Does it make sense to you? What I'm saying, like that means, um, you, the brain has its own time, right? Time you can't you can't tell the brain. I want to be better by next week, right? Yes, but yes. yeah, yeah. So I think there is this, uh, there is one the, the physiology part of things, but there's also the emotional part of things, and I think the emotional part really sometimes uh does impact, uh, recovery. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's one thing I've learned it's from some of my patients. I can think of two analogies. One would be like planting roses. Mm. And you can try to water it correctly, use the correct fertilizer and so on. But ultimately, whether the, the plant uh, blooms, you, you don't have that final control. And there's no point getting angry with the rose plant. Right. It right. doesn't bloom next week. So, so I think, but I think, um, so the question for us would be how to continue to do our best without uh, being stressed by yeah. the disappointment or expectations. I, I think that's a yeah. life lesson for everybody, I guess. Yeah, I, I know um, it's easier said than done. I know for some patients, they find solace in faith or perhaps they find solace in other things that they are good at, which may not be so uh, linguistically demanding. So mm -hmm. for them, they find, you know, and, and um, we movie called aphasia uh, and this guy was an actor a stage actor um, in midwest us and he suddenly had a stroke and has rather severe aphasia but of course he uh, decided to make a movie about it and he said that the thing that really helped him in his recovery because he was going through depression was getting a dog right he actually had a pet and he he said that really helped him uh, he would even on bad days, he finds that he can talk to his pet. Because obviously the dog will just listen to him, right? <laughs> and, and that helped him in his, uh, you know, his therapy also. Like in a way, like having the, it's almost like a therapy pet. I'm not saying everybody should get pets, huh? but I'm just saying, you know, everybody finds their own group along the way, what, what works for them. Um, but I, I think it is very natural to feel upset. Um, but if possible, try to um, think on the positive side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, yeah, and, and it's okay to be not okay. La. It's okay to be not okay. I think let, let time, yeah, let time play out. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I just want to thank also patients who, yeah, uh, sorry, not patients, audience, audience members who actually continue to keep um, yeah, sending in comments. Uh. Uh, I think Mindy uh, wrote a comment in response to what we said earlier about nursing homes. So she said, oh, sometimes when an incident happens, the family members are caught. And their immediate concern is the professional care for patients. So first thing in mind is sending patients to nursing homes. Uh, so effort has to be made to create more awareness of benefits of recovering at home and what are the resources available for patients who wish to recover at home. Yeah. At this juncture, can um, Dr. Chan, do you have any um, you know, inspiring case studies or stories that you want to share with us? Uh, you know, yeah. I would uh share my screen again and, oh, yeah, yeah. and I would fast forward some uh, to just two slides. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so this yeah. was a slide of a patient. She had motor neuron disease, so she didn't have a stroke. Um, and motor neuron disease is what uh, Stephen Hawking had, you know, and you, we all know that he continued to research physics and to teach. But essentially, it prevents you from breathing, moving, but your mind is still very active. So she invented this herself. She had a letter chart. So, Zing, so yeah. she taught her family members to go like point to this one, two, three. So for example, if she wanted to make a sentence, she'll go one, does the husband will go one, two, and then she with her thumb, she can barely move but her thumb, she'll tap on this metal plate, tuck, and then the husband will go 
F G H I and she'll tap again. Mm. Then the husband will write on the whiteboard I. And then she will have some way of indicating the next word. And then it goes one, two, three, four, five, tap. U V W tap. Mm. And so on and so forth. Then she can communicate. Actually, she she was a Soka Gakai here. So Soka Gakai is a Japanese new Buddhist kind of movement. And she wrote very beautiful, inspiring testimonies about finding solace and hope in the midst of her suffering, mm, which mm. she shared with uh, all the other people. So I, I think this was a very positive patient, but I really learned so much from her. Inspiring, this story. I mean, yeah. it's amazing. Can I just um, you know, ask you a question? Uh, because you said she invented this herself. What happened to the speech therapist? <laughs> I mean, this looks like this looks like a communication board that we would sometimes prescribe to patients. Oh, okay. Um, I I don't know, but but I, I think the Tantau Singh speech therapist have a more complex uh, letter chart which they can mm-hmm. tend to so use. Uses, okay. So yeah. but I think this one, if I'm not wrong, was invented by the patient herself. Fantastic, inspiring. Uh, yeah, but she was also uh, one of the earlier generation ALS patients, motor neuron disease patients, where after they go home, it's very hard for them to continue seeing therapists and so on. So I think, unfortunately, in the early years, the focus was very much on uh, just the physical treatment. And then if we could get them a ventilator and make sure that the tracheostomy tube is uh, okay and no infection there. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's only the last few years that we actually, I think from 2015 onwards that our program actually, we have a in-house speech therapist who is an mm-hmm. integral part of the home ventilation team. Mm-hmm. And then our ICUs also started to have in-house speech therapists. So, so STs have uh, grown in importance and stature in, in our professional community in the last five years. Very glad to hear that. Yeah. Of course, now we have very high tech things like using the eye gaze tracker yeah. to, to communicate. So, so Singapore is again thanks to the Singapore government. So, okay, can I share two, two amazing stories here? One yes. is a very generous family member. So, one of my motor neuron disease patients, she was well to do, but her father said, Dr. Chan, what happens to people who are, you know, living with very lower middle class, like three-room flat or two-room flat, how do they then communicate? They can't afford the Toby. So I tell him, yeah, in truth, uh, they can't afford it because of $15,000. So what can we do? So he said, uh, so, so I spoke to my speech therapy, HOD, and then I said, can we do something? So we decided to set up a fund. And then this father of my patient very generously gave the first $10,000 down payment. I think when one good action leads to many good things happening, so other people are inspired to donate mm. also. So the charity rapidly raised 40000 and they bought wow. three or four of these devices, which were meant to be uh, loaned out for free to... And then very soon after, now must thank Singapore government. So those are anti-government, uh, uh, please think again. Singapore government came out with an assistive technology fund. So with ATF, you can use it to buy technology devices that help you live better. <laughs> so now what we do is speech therapists will let them trial on this. And then when they trial and they find that they can use it, not everybody can use this because some don't have the eye movement, some don't have the ability to concentrate. But for those who can benefit from it, then they use ATF to buy. So, so this synergy, public-private synergy. Mm. And I must thank that generous donor for the first money, our speech therapies and charity fund for their grit and perseverance in pushing through this, and Singapore government for now <laughs> sustaining this. <laughs> I mean, this this is great. I mean, I wow, well, this is this story is fantastic. I love it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Tell us more about this, please. Yeah. This this gentleman didn't have a aphasia, so this is Riz Sunawa. Those of you who are Malays, so remember him as a news uh, reader. He's a fantastic um uh, public figure. So he had motor neuron disease, and I think initially in the ICU we were not most of the doctors were not confident that he could speak. But when we, we didn't invent this, so we learned it from our expert friends overseas. Uh, but when he finally recovered uh, free use of his voice, this is what he did. Hey everyone, 2020 has been a tough year, especially so for us, the vulnerable ones. 
and to all my home ventilator users, hey, we've been through a lot. So stay strong, stay positive and happy 2021. So again, I, I would say that not every patient can do this because those with aphasia will not be able to find the words and string the sentences like that. Those with this atria won't be able to do it. He had uh, mainly a breathing muscle weakness. So the ventilator lends him the air to make the sound. But that said, you know, a lot of us in ICU, we used to think that with the breathing machine and the breathing tube, you should not have a leak and therefore you should not be able to make a sound. So it it involved a change in paradigm, a change in the uh, whole mm. mental model saying, okay, instead of when you recover, I dial down the ventilator setting so that you, you use less and less pressure. Now I'm actually dialing up the pressures and so you can use the excess uh, pressure to generate a voice. And the other paradigm, of course, is that in a closed system, the, the airways don't dry out so much. But in his case, his lungs were dry out because he's, He's uh, breathing out through the mouth, breathing in through the tube. So we had to figure out how to humidify the air and so on. So there are changes which I was discussing with my colleagues in ICU from other hospitals. We will try to put in place in as many hospitals in Singapore as possible so that those patients who have the ability to speak should be able to speak and, and not be robbed of their voice because of us. Right. I mean, and this is this is mind-blowing stuff, right? He sounds good. He sounds really, yeah. really good. Yeah. Wow. Oh, so oh. I, I, I am mindful of the time, but because today is our last episode, we're going to give everybody a bonus, a bonus as we're going to overrun, okay? So we really want to hear the rest of the, the stories. So stay with us, Facebook audience. And if you have comments, please type in your comments. We will love to hear from you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, Dr. Chan, we have to hear this story. Good recovery from a severe stroke. We have to hear this. This yeah. gentleman is uh, Mr. Mendoza. He's a Filipino engineer, but he's lived in Singapore for more than 20 years. He He's professional contribution has contributed to Singapore society tremendously. Mm -hmm. He's also from a very loving family. So his wife, his daughter, and uh, he had a very, very severe stroke. It didn't affect the cortical part of the brain. It affected the central part of the brain. So initially he was like really not moving. The technical term would be that he was in a locked-in state. Mm -hmm. And well, I... I actually did the tracheostomy for him. So you see this tube here is the breathing tube through the front of the neck. So I was the doctor who performed the tracheostomy. Um, I wasn't his ICU doctor. Mm. So it was a colleague who asked me to do the tracheostomy. Then initially my thought was, are we sure we want to do this? His, you know, his neurological the injury was so severe. Um, well, are we prolonging the suffering? Mm. But his wife came, knew that I was going to do the procedure and she grabbed my hand and she said, Doctor, uh, I'm sure he will get better, you know, and, and we are praying very much, so please do it. So we did the tracheostomy and through, initially we didn't have much response from him. Subsequently, we realized he could look up and down. So he was literally locked in, so he can only look up and down. But I think what was fortunate for him was that the stroke, it was mainly the brain swelling that led to this loss of function. So when the swelling subsided, so not every stroke patient will make this kind of amazing recovery because some, if the, if the area of blood insufficiency or the area of bleeding is permanent, then you can't have this. But in his case, it was the swelling. So when the swelling subsided, he, he could like move a, a bit of his hand, maybe started with one hand or, and maybe one foot. And then this was when we visited him at home because he needed a breathing machine at that time. So he was on the home ventilation program. Hmm. When we visited him, he could do hey, Jamie, can you touch my hand with your right hand? Okay, good. Okay, we continue, Jamie. Can you touch your finger to your thumb? Okay, index finger, ring thing, middle finger, ring finger, so you little see you finger. Understand what okay, you're good. Thank you. Well, so you need to practice and exercise, okay? He could understand video one. and he could okay. give a thumbs up gesture, but at that point he wasn't verbal because even though he had a speaking valve, he wasn't talking. Mm. Then he persevered, his wife persevered. I think they're Filipino, so we encourage him to sing karaoke or sing hymns. And this was him sending me a greeting at a, I can't remember, it's Easter. Oh, Easter. Hey, Jamie, can you touch my hand with your right hand? 
he he sent me that that uh video because it was Easter and he wanted to share the joy and by then he could speak in a short phrase. This was him a bit later, and um I did I did check in with him uh and his wife whether he, we could share this because he was rather emotional, and I think you will see that he was probably reading from a script that his wife was holding up. But this was what he wanted to thank our team for, for whatever we have done. But actually, we did very little. It is his perseverance and his wife's love. Mm. And uh, they are very devout Christians, Catholics, and they believe God really protected them. Right. HPR. Uh, as a to you. As to you. What is it for? Go. Oh. And? I am. I am. On my next. On my next. On my next. On my that is that is what that is. So he he has continued to make very good progress, and um, again at this point I must say everybody's illness is different, so don't be impatient if you are not seeing mm. this in yourself mm. uh, and don't don't be angry you know but if you don't hope if he had gone to a nursing home at that point when he was only looking up and down he would still be only looking up and down because unfortunately while the nursing home people would be really looking after him very well from the point of view of his nutrition his skin care maybe even the range of motion exercises uh, dispensing his medicine but there won't be that kind of loving interaction that comes from the wife and the daughter and his old friends the other thing is um, I think when we have a stroke or a neurological injury don't be shy to meet up with your old friends you look different you may not be so handsome you have a droop in the corner of the face you may have lost a lot of weight but I think your friends who care for you the ones your real friends are still your friends. And I think it is very tough for a nuclear family, just a spouse or children, to provide you with all the emotional needs that you need. Mm. So I think leverage on extended family and friends. Don't be shy to ask for help. Time, they come and spend some time with you, then your nuclear family can, can have some respite. They can go out and chill. It's very important that the nuclear family looking after you have their own time. And if you have mates, Please allow the mate to go out on the Sunday. Please allow the mate to, to, to do the exercise because caregiving is very tough. Yeah. But I think it takes a village to rehabilitate a stroke patient. But I think this uh, Mr. Mendoza, he had very loyal friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so his friends and family who love him that helped him a lot. I believe in God. So I believe God helped him a lot also. Mm. But you know, one of our former neurosurgical professors, he's an emeritus professor, Ong Teck Leong, great neurosurgeon. He used to say, ask us, is this patient loved? Mm. Then he would cryptically, he's a very fierce surgeon also, he would scold us if we didn't examine a patient properly and if we miss out some fact. But during the ward round, he asked us, is this patient loved? Then if we say, yeah, 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 his wife is very caring, and stuff, then he would say, the patient will do well. And that was the like essence of his uh, 50 years of clinical practice. And now as I grow older and I look at my patients, I see the wisdom of his, uh, his observation. So, so I think we, 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 may own, we probably will all fall sick one day, we'll get cancer, stroke or heart attack. When we are sick, please don't be shy to demand of your loved ones. And if you have a loved one who is sick, you don't have that much time with that person anyway. No, it, it's worth it to change your life a little bit, you know, to sleep less, to, to give up maybe a, a very high paying job, to stop traveling overseas, stop flying business class, because you won't have your loved one with you forever. But 
whatever you can do for your loved one in these few months or years will be so beautiful a legacy. So I, I want to end on this note, the importance of family and friends' love. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Chan, I, I really thank you for your sharing. It's very candid. Um, I, you know, it's not often that we hear a physician talking about you know, something that's non-medical. And, and um, I think in this case, you really hit the nail on the head. Lah. I love all your analogies, by the way. I'm quite sure I will steal some of them. <laughs> the rose analogy was fantastic. Uh, we have comments um, and, and uh, Sylvia, Sylvia says, thanks for your sharing, Dr. Chan and Evelyn. It's very encouraging. Um, Mindy actually uh, had a question earlier um, and I think maybe you addressed it a little bit, um, but maybe you can sum it up. Huh? She said, I heard and read that there's a golden period where a stroke patient can re uh, benefit from rehab. How true is this golden period? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not qualified to speak about this because I'm not a neurologist. Mm. <laughs> I, you know, we, you know, there's this, there's this thing, uh, like we always say, like first six months, try to, that's when neuroplasticity is, you know, at, at its, um, you know, at, at its best, right? Like prime, right? But I just want to say to all our listeners out there, yes, there is this, um, time frame where you want to really maximize your potential. Uh, the more, the faster you can get to rehab, and the more you can do, it is good, right? Because it's um, stimulating uh, your brain, and then you know, re rebuilding neural pathways. But don't don't give up hope. You know, studies. You know, increasing studies have uh, bodies of studies have showed us that with aphasia, especially with aphasia, people continue to recover, or they actually continue to make gains right progress over the years so so yeah don't 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 be just hung up on this uh golden period right doesn't mean that after six months ah, yeah, that's it Liao. okay no it's not it's not okay like just continue to to keep going and keep going out with friends i love some of the um you know uh, what, what dr chan said about going out with friends um having a social group yeah, so I think at this point, because we have overrun by 10 minutes, and I did say 10 minutes, I just want to say when it comes to social groups, if you are um, a caregiver living with aphasia, or if you are somebody with aphasia, I would like to um, urge you to reach out to us uh, and be a part of our community. Um, you will get to meet new friends and you get to meet other caregivers and also other patients who share similar struggles and challenges. Um, yeah, we and our volunteers are, are very... Uh, empathetic and very well trained in this area you know I dare say our volunteers even those who are not speech therapists in fact many of our volunteers are not speech therapists now uh, but they're very um, understanding and knowledgeable so join us all our programs are free um, you know obviously volunteer for Aphasia SG and um, if you've been following if you tune in today and you like what you have heard you might want to catch up on our earlier episodes then please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have a lot of original content. Uh, we have, you know, uh, animated videos like this, describing what is aphasia, you know, very short clips. If you're a student, you know, whether you are an ST, OT, PT student, I urge you to subscribe to us. You will find a lot of amazing content, uh, very Asian-centric, very Singapore-centric content. And um, obviously you don't need to, <laughs> Facebook, uh, you're on Facebook already, right? So uh, please follow us and then follow us on Instagram as well. Uh, yeah, I think um, that's all we have. We are so, so glad to end this on a high note because today is actually the last day of Aphasia Awareness Month also. Uh, it's been an invigorating month. Uh, we have met many, many um, caregivers, you know, and we have actually had the opportunity to meet so many experts like yourself, Dr. Chan. Yeah, so yeah, I, do you have any, any last words or anything on your wish list for our community, you know? Uh, maybe not just aphasia, la, but for the community or population of people with communication, adults with communication impairment in Singapore. Wish list. <laughs> I never quite thought about it. And uh, <laughs> I, I think um, uh, I'm growing old. I'm very cognizant that I'm growing old. I, I hope that we all grow closer as a community that is uh, very accepting and loving. We, we reach out a little bit for each other, even if it's a, at a bit of pain to ourselves. And I think you I think Singapore will have hope and if we can do that, you know, um, let's, we, we've spent like 30 years uh, trying to become a first world country. Now let's try to become a first world country with a heart. Yeah, yeah. So not just the, the hardware, but we also want the hardware, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to all our Facebook 
um, listeners. Um, uh, there's a comment from Evelyn, uh, yeah, Evelyn Lui, who says, Dr. Chan, thank you for your deep empathy and your strong defense for the welfare and rights of patients and caregivers. And we have Mika Mendoza. Is that the, yeah. <laughs> She says, thank you, Dr. Chan and the whole team, HVRSS. Thank you. Thank you for allowing um, the videos to be screened, Nika. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to end it here. Uh, to all our Facebook audience, thank you once again. And Dr. Chan, thank you so much for making time for us this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Goodbye, everyone. Bye from Aphasia SG.